Well, if I was a disc jockey, I would say the old clock on the wall is 9.32. The class starts at 9.30. But uh, we're a little out of sync because Warren's not here with us this morning. And that's, I got a text from him. His mother is dying. And uh, he and his sister are... Um, making preparations for all of that. So he uh, informed me yesterday, and I thought, well, how do you replace the irreplaceable? So I will open us in prayer this morning, uh, particularly wanting to pray again for Stanton and the Newman family. Uh, my friend Jay Bruce, uh, from Oklahoma City, went to Eric Alexander's service last week in Glasgow and uh, with a group from the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals and specifically had a prayer for Stanton in Glasgow. I said, well, I now know he's been prayed for from all of Europe. Uh, as well as right here at Believer's Chapel. And this really has to be ground zero for us because uh, this is Mark's class and this is Mark's church and he has given us such great leadership and service over the years. It is our privilege to pray for him uh, during this providence that God has thrown his family into. So uh, I'll read these Proverbs and then we'll pray together. We are in uh, Proverbs chapter 26, beginning in verse 25. And then we'll go all the way to uh, Proverbs 27. My goodness, where's the time gone? We're flying through this book of Proverbs together. 26.25, uh, you may have he or the one who makes his speech gracious. Do not trust him. For, that little for right there is the key to the proverb. You have to... Uh, understand that for for seven abominations are in his heart or you might if your text says fills his heart that is not a good translation because that's not the word it is the idea that the abominations are there and they're settled they haven't come and been poured into the heart not the idea. Uh, 2626, his hatred is concealed by deception. His evil is revealed in the congregation. Certainly a proverb regarding a fool, 2627. As for the one who digs a pit, he will fall into it. As for the one who rolls a stone, it will return to him. And then 27.1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring or bring forth the idea. 27.2. Let a stranger and not your own mouth praise you. An outsider, but not your own mouth lips. And three, 27, three, the weight of a stone and the burden of sand, but the vexation of a fool is heavier than both. That's an interesting idea. Uh, four, cruelty and wrath are the torrents of anger, but who can stand before jealousy. And five, open rebuke is better than concealed love. That is uh, 
complex ideas there, crisscrossing, open rebuke, conceal love. And finally, the sixth proverb, 27, six this morning, the wounds of a friend are faithful, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive. Uh, I would like for you to set a tab this morning at a text we will look at that will supplement one of our Proverbs this morning. That is Psalm 7. So if you'll set a tab there, we will look at that Psalm or a verse of that Psalm that will fit nicely into our lesson and study this morning. Well, I know if you have just come in from the last rushing across the parking lot to get into your Sunday school room and waiting to see Mark, I share your disappointment. Um, But unfortunately, the providence of God has him at the hospital. And went to see him yesterday. And... This is a family that's really suffering. And the providence of God has blown into his life as it blows into all of our lives at different stages and times. The Proverbs are going to address an issue uh, this morning in a couple of occasions. When God looks untrustworthy, Uh, at times like these, dark providences. Uh, What do we do? How do we think? Because they happen to us all. That's where Mark is today. He's uh, all smiles but suffering. And uh, and we want to be sure to pray for Warren as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, Father, what a rich privilege we have uh, bearing the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, entering into your presence boldly because we plead the blood that is the forgiveness of sins that gives us access into your presence. But yet, even in access, we confess we're powerless to communicate with you. But you have made all that provision for us by the power of the Holy Spirit speaking through Him to you, Father. You hear our moans. You hear our groanings. You hear our pain. And we have it as a class today because our great leader has gone into a dark, dark time. And so we would pray for him this morning for comfort, for encouragement, for Mark, Cindy, for all the family, Lord, You know well what is going on physically with Stanton. Uh, We are just just watching uh, his improvement slowly, surely, but with every moment there is also danger because of his weakened condition. But it's the danger that we share each and every day. Because as we contemplate the Scriptures, we know there's no such thing as good health or bad health. We're all just dependent on You, our Lord, our God, who fashioned our days, who put us to life, and who gave us a new life. And in that new life, we are to look to you for everything, each and every day. That's the providence of God that you've placed us in. And we recognize it. We don't shy away from it. 
We cry out in times of pain and darkness. Lord, save us. Lord, help us. Lord, we are in need. And that's our lives. That's the, the frame that you put us in. You know we're but dust. But you're great and you're powerful and you have a plan and you have a purpose. And so we would pray this morning, extend your scepter from heaven and extend to us all that wonderful grace and peace that you alone provide in times such as this. And so, Father, uh, be with our dear friend Warren, who leads us. He leads our congregation in prayer and singing. He leads his class in prayer. His, his years of constant service is a testimony to each and every one of us. This is a man of God. And now he has the, the hard task of putting his mother away. But she knows you. And so we're grateful. But we join him in the pain of that providence. We are all fellow sojourners. Just making it through life thanking You for the people that You put there to aid us and encourage us and build us up like Warren, like Mark. We're so grateful for them. Thank You for the testimony of this church. And it has stood now for decades on Your truth, Your righteousness, Your Word, that's so important to us all. We don't cling to a building, but the building is where we meet. And we cling to one another as fellow travelers through this life. Encouraging one another. Ministering to one another. Embracing one another. Because these are your people and they are our Brethren, and so we don't take that lightly. And so we come at this hour in thanksgiving, in praise, in the reality that you are the sunshine and the blessing of our day, each and every day. Thank you for the people that you have assembled here. They are life-changing to me. And their extended hand of fellowship and relationship have been so vital to my growing up in Christ Jesus. So bless us all to that end. That we would all reach out, minister to one another, as only you give us the opportunity to do so. And we have it now in prayer both for Warren and for Mark. And we do that in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ who brought us all together to make us one in Him. In whose name we pray. Amen. Okay. This, uh, we start this morning with... Uh, Proverbs 26, 25. Gracious speech that is not to be trusted. That's almost a contradiction, isn't it? The skill being taught is not to trust. Now what is that about? The entire proverb, as I mentioned in the reading of it, is uh, held together uh, for our purposes, by that little particle for, F-O-R in the second line, or your translation may be 
for uh, because it explains why we are not to trust and gives definition to the proverb. We open with beguiling speech practiced by a gracious voice. The beguiling part is the mind of the author. The gracious voice is what we hear outside. Here's this word gracious. It sets the context for us. It's Genesis 33, 5. Jacob uses the word with his brother Esau. Jacob had wrestled with the angel, the angel of the Lord, which is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And he has now crossed the river and he had waves of sheep and goats and now wives and children all going before Esau, his brother. And finally he meets Esau face to face. And the first question that his brother asks him is, who are these? Who are these? And his answer is our word. These are the children that God has, our word, graciously given to your servant. So what is this word gracious that's in our proverb? It's a humble voice. It's a contrite voice. He speaks with grace. That's the idea. And the end of the top line comes the hammer. Here's the reality of the proverb. Don't trust the voice. Now, trust needs some digging. It's the famous Old Testament word for reliable. Why do we drive over a bridge? Well, we drive over a bridge because we trust the bridge. We believe the bridge to be reliable. All those cables that steal everywhere, we say to ourselves, that's a reliable bridge. Looks reliable. So we drive over it. That's the idea of the word. Trust. It's reliable. You can count on it. And that's where the rub comes in reality. Our life. Because there are times in our lives that God doesn't look trustworthy at all. He doesn't look reliable. What is happening to me? Why is this happening to me? And there are times that God takes us all through that are like that. I love the comment of Job in the midst of his darkness and suffering. He says, if I could only sit down across from him and talk to him, looking eyeball to eyeball, and he could hear the sound of my voice, then he would know that I have done nothing but have loved him completely and totally. And look at me. Look at the disaster of my life. That's Job. Here is the central thought of this trust or faithfulness. Psalm 8950, it asks the question, Lord, where is your trust? Your trustworthiness. That's the word hesed that we've often talked about. Can't define it. There's 27 different English renderings to the word. It's a word from not among us. It is a word from God only because language is inadequate to define it or to explain it. Like jello on the wall, it just doesn't stick. There's always some other aspect to the word, and we have to try to get our brain around it, and we can't. 
And so he asked in Psalm 89.50, where is your covenant faithfulness, your trustworthiness that you swore to David? The psalmist asked. And he ends that question with this word, our word, from the proverb, in trust. You delivered that covenant faithfulness to us in trust. We considered your word and you both to be reliable, adequate, sufficient, like a bridge. And where is it? That is the plea of a man who had read the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 15. The Lord said, My covenant loyalty will never be removed from David as I did with Saul. And what the psalmist sees is disaster. You promised to be faithful to David. You promised to be reliable to David. And now look at David's people. Where have you been? Where are you? And that's what the psalm inquires about. Trust. You always have a reason in life not to trust Him. But the Scriptures are clear. When you come to times like that, you wait. You wait. You wait in hope. You wait in blindness. You wait in darkness. You wait when everything seems to be falling apart. You wait. And God will arrive. And God will show you that He has a great plan and a great purpose for all of this. So here, back to our proverb, is the four that's so important. It substantiates why we are to rely upon the Lord and why we are not to rely upon a gracious voice. Seven, the perfect or complete number. And abominations. We've talked about that word a lot in Proverbs. Immediate revulsion. It is something that we turn our heads away from. We don't want to participate in it. The rotten egg. I don't have to define it. I don't have to look it up. I know what it is if I'm close to it. That's an abomination. And what the proverb is saying is there are the complete number of abominations, seven, in the heart of the fool. That's why you can never trust His voice. That is the life of the unregenerate. Abominations reside, not fill up, reside. He is an unbeliever. And he sees the world not from a perspective of wisdom, but one of foolishness. So, the number seven is a full panoply of why we are reviled by this individual. He has no righteous sensibilities. And the location of those, notice, is the center of the fool, his heart, where everything emanates. Another fool in life that is not to be trusted, no matter the, how he talks, or what he does, we are to never rely upon him. So let's answer this question. If we come across a stranger whose voice is gracious, what's the practical? What's the how do for that? I've got the answer for you from the scriptures. It's Genesis 24 19. Genesis 24, the servant of Abram went to find the one in a million woman. The woman that would be the wife of Isaac. And he treads off and travels for many months 
with camels, ten. And he makes his way to a well. He prays. I'm praying, he says, for a specific woman who will give me a drink and then will also agree to water my camels. Just as he was praying, and in the middle of that prayer, without finishing that prayer, here comes Rebecca. And she, he asked her for a drink, and she said, yes, and I'll water your camels also. Just like he prayed. But, here's the difference between the servant and me. You see, I'm ready to crown her princess, but not this wise man. What does he do? He sits quietly watching. Genesis 24, 19. To see if what she claimed is what she did. In other words, did her mouth conform to her performance? That's trustworthiness. That's what you learn from the Scriptures. Does a stranger's mouth match their deeds? That would be a trustworthy person. And then you can anoint them with credibility. Here's 26. Hatred concealed. Let, let's begin by just observing the parallels in this proverb. Line 1, conceals, matched by revealed in line 2. Deception, line one, is matched by evil, line two. The training from the home, the mother and father, to this child, which is what the book of Proverbs is, prepares the child for enemies in life. That they will not be naive. Fools live by their own wits, never by guidance, by their own internal instincts, which are always deadly and wrong. Fools, living by their wits, have concealed hatreds. That's the proverb. And their motive is hatred. Same word that we found in Proverbs 122. How long will fools hate, there's your word, knowledge? Here is the behavior of the hated concealed by deception. The word concealed is very interesting. It really occurs in a humorous place in Scripture. Uh, Genesis chapter 20 and verse 16. It turns out that this Abimelech has confiscated Sarah and brought her into his harem. And uh, that night, in the middle of the night, he had a dream. God said, you're a dead man. Now, I don't know how dreams are, but apparently God's dreams are three-dimensional, bright colors. They get the message. Whether it's the Pharaoh or the Abimelech here, he got the message. You're as good as a dead man for the woman that you took in. Well, this Abimelech couldn't wait for the sunrise in the morning. He not only gave Sarai back to her husband, but he gave her back with a thousand pieces of silver. Amazing what a dream in the middle of the night can do to a man's generosity, isn't it? And that's the word, conceal, that we had. Deception in the function to literally entertain false hopes. Now that's the definition in the lexicon. Let me give that to you in Dallas, Texas. It's called lying. Entertain false hopes. No, that's just lying. Can anyone say Genesis chapter 3, the serpent in the garden? 
He lied to the woman. Line two, here's the activity that's so-called evil. Oh boy, what a great deal we have for you. With a handshake and with a smile, this revealing will be publicly exposed. This liar, this deceptive person, he's immoral. Now the word congregation. It's really not the idea of a church service. When we see congregation, that's what we think about. But this is the Old Testament. This is the assembly at the gate. This is where law and order occur. This is where righteousness prevails in an organized economy. And there, at the assembly, at the gate, matters are settled, and they are settled with this man. He is put out. Today, we run the cameras in front of an individual as he's being handcuffed and escorted to a squad car. That's the idea of the word. Now, it occurs in life that some people may get away with things. Not in this proverb. No one's getting away with it. But it could occur in life. They robbed the bank. They never found the money. They never found the person. That could very well happen. Jewel thieves, famous jewel thieves, go on from one theft after another after another and never get caught. But here's what we know from the Scriptures. That you get away with nothing that in fact, you are going to have a confrontation unimaginable when you stand before the Lord of light and truth and justice. There, my friends, there is no escaping. And that's what every thief and liar is headed for. This is a time to repent right now in this venue, in this occasion, repent. The Lord will forgive you. Plead the blood. It will cleanse you. But there is no hope after death. It is appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. Here's 27. The background of this proverb is the reality of the living God and His will that accomplishes His purpose every single day. Do you hear the clock ticking? Every tick to the clock, His will is being accomplished. I want you to look at the beauty of this proverb itself. It's perfectly balanced. We have very few perfectly balanced proverbs. Let me show you that. Both lines are parallel one to another. You may have he, or you may have as for the one. That's the opening in both stanzas. Look at digs. Line one, it matches rolls to line two. Pit, line one, it matches stone, line two. The consequences are matching as well. The final words, fall into it. And line two, return to him. See how it perfectly balances? Everything from line one to line two is like a straight arrow to the next thought. It's a beautifully balanced proverb. Now, it may seem, or it may appear, that the wicked have prevailed. They have prevailed in life, that they've conquered life. But Proverbs 26, 27 tells us, don't you believe it? Don't believe it? We're one second. Here's the truth. Those who try to hurt others will, in fact, hurt themselves. That is a universal truth. 
That's the word of God. That's the reality. That's why I wanted you to take a look at this Psalm 7. Psalm 7 and verse 14. It really gives us an insight into the wicked person's behavior. Behold, an evil person, and I love this figure here, is pregnant with injustice. What a beautiful image that is. What do we do with a pregnancy? We wait nine months. We nurture it along. Remember? You got out those books and you said, well, here's, here's how that baby is forming this week. And, and look, look how it's come along. And, and then we ran around, didn't we, gentlemen? What can I do for you, sweetheart? You need a pillow? Uh, how about another bowl of vanilla ice cream and some pickles? The whole nine yards. We nurtured their pregnancy along. Well, look at this. Pregnancy with injustice. He who conceives harm. Conceives. It comes out of the depths of his dark heart and gives birth to lies. So he's conceived it on the inside. Now he regurgitates it on the outside. This is his plan. This is his deception. But look what David says. He has dug a pit. So let's get the shovel out mentally. He's digging it. But he's not just digging it. Look what he's doing. He's hollowing it out. Now he's standing in the middle of the ditch. Now he's clearing out the debris in the middle of the ditch. All of this is a picture of labor, activity, energy, painstakingly. He scoops it out. And here is the grand climax, only to fall into it himself. That's the truth of the Word of God. Divine providence rules over men. That's what your proverb is saying. May think that they're getting away with it. Scot free. Fooled them this time. No. Divine providence rules over men and it doesn't matter how this individual falls into the pit. It's immaterial. The point is, he gets there. God make sure of it. That's what the proverb is saying. That's what it's teaching and telling us. The word pit was a trap to kill an animal. With cunning deception, with deadly intention, the pit was dug. Line two, rolling a stone, the physical act of moving a stone, too big to be carried. This word stone and rolling is actually found in Genesis 29.3 and used of Jacob rolling a stone away from the mouth of the well so Rachel's sheep could get a drink. The idea of rolling is extreme exertion. He's working. He's diligent. He's engaged. Pushing the boulder up the hill. Can you see him? Here he goes. Cranking away. Only to find God's gravity at work. And what is it? It's His sovereignty. It's His providence. It's going to roll back on Him or return to Him. That word will is a future certainty. Return is the sovereignty of God and His plan. Do you really believe you're in control of your life? You really believe you're in control? No, my friends, you're not in control. But you can weave your plan. You can execute your plan. And just like Haman in Esther chapter 7, in just a matter of moments, thinking you've got this whole thing worked out, in a matter of moments, you lose the relationship with the king and that costs you your life. Like that. That's what the proverb is teaching. Here it is. That's the life of faith. 
That's the revelation of God. Here's 27.1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you know you do not know what a day may bring forth. I was a student in elementary school on November 22nd, 1963. John F. Kennedy was visiting Dallas, Texas, and there he was assassinated. He was to deliver a speech at the Dallas Trademark out on Stimmons Expressway. And the local television stations, I can't remember which one, sent a reporter out there and he was to film the president coming through the doors from the back, film the crowd. He was to show the event. Some producer was smart enough to tell him after the assassination and the flee to Parkland Hospital, no, stay right there. Here's what I want you to film. The back of the room. All the empty chairs. And then he goes up on the podium. Film it. He goes behind the president's chair itself. And he, he films it. All black and white. And then the narration. This is where the president was to have sat. This was his placemat. After I became a Christian, I began to think about that. I remembered that. Uh, um, a meal prepared that was never eaten. Um, a speech in some AIDS uh, briefcase that never pulled out, was never delivered. What happened? The providence of God happened. And it happened in a moment. And suddenly, everything changed. Don't boast about tomorrow. You have no idea about tomorrow. You have no idea about 2 o'clock this afternoon. What's the proverb trying to teach us? Well, look. Here are the words in the top line. Do not boast. It should be understood as a warning. Bragging is fools. Ben-Hadad, king of Aram. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 5. I will demand of you he says to the official in the northern kingdom, your silver, your gold, your wives, your children, and about this time tomorrow, he says, I'm going to send my officials to search your palaces, your houses, and they will seize your silver and gold, your wives, your children, and everything of value and take it away. And the answer given to Ben-Hadad is 1 Kings 20, verse 11. It's very clever. One who pulls off his armor should not brag as one who puts it on. In other words, there's an event. And that event hadn't taken place. All your verbato is about tomorrow. You think you've got the size, the army, the strength. You think you've got it, everything covered, all your bases? No. Because God's got tomorrow. That's essentially the answer. And the next day, all of his boasting was futility because the army of Aram was destroyed. Boasting about the future. Claiming what would be the history didn't occur. Why? God's sovereign. Why? God rules. He rules over everything in your life. The Proverbs teach the plain and simple course of knowing that He controls the future and not you. Matter of fact, that's the height of arrogance. Men believe they control the future. Don't do it. 
We're, our boasting, which was this man's confidence in himself, in what he had, we're told in the Scriptures our boasting, same word, should be in one thing, in one thing only, the Lord. This is what the Lord does. This is the Lord, the all-powerful. This is who He is, what He is. Let me tell you about Him. That's our boasting. See the word tomorrow? It's a reference to Ben-Hadad's immediate future. Something that he does not control. Feats of strength and warfare. What did what big Goliath say to David? 1 Samuel 17, 41. I'm going to give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals. For the big guy, it was over in a matter of seconds. You see, the four explains the wise resolution. Here's what we know. Here's the way we think. We don't know what a day will bring. What's a day? It's a measuring stick of time. Bring forth. That is the sovereignty of God and His all-divine, all-wise providence over us. A skill for living is to fear the Lord. To trust our days to Him. Knowing that He has measured each and every day out for His sovereign purpose to be accomplished. And you know what that sovereign purpose is? That you would be conformed to His image for His glory. That's what history is all about. That's why He brought you to Himself. That you would be made like Him. And here it is. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's your purpose. That's your intent. And He is going to see to it that you're going to be there with Him for all eternity. That's security. Nothing here is secure. May God give us the wisdom to practice that in our lives daily. The sure thing is Him, and nothing else is sure. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study together this morning. Thank you for assembling these people. We have all come from different backgrounds, different places, but you have brought us together to worship you. And we do that with a great resolve to live under you, your divine providence, your sovereignty, each and every day with a clean conscience knowing that you have made all necessary provisions for all of us in every way in Christ Jesus. Thank you for our elders. Thank you for their leadership. Bless their families. Bless our deacons, their families. Thank you for all the many things that they do behind the scenes that we never see. We're so grateful for them and so grateful for this place. And now we give you thanks in the powerful name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.